Okay. And we're off. So the first thing I want to do really is just introduce myself, just in case anybody doesn't know, I'm Kieran O'Donnell. I'm the head of Wolverhampton Music Service, and we're also the lead organisation in the Music Hub. And I'll say a little bit about that uh, a bit later on. Um, I also want to introduce Nathan Holder, Professor Nathan Holder. Uh, uh, we're in a bit of a collaboration with uh, Nate because we've off, we've had some training in his through his work. But Nate is a musician and an author and a speaker on all things diversifying the curriculum. Uh, and part of our collaboration has been that we want to promote our uh, new equity, diversity and inclusion strategy. And Nate has just released a new book and today's World Book Day. And we've been out in schools um, handing out copies of Nate's new book and every primary school in Wolverhampton will receive a copy of Nate's new book and I'm sure you'll I'm sure you've got plenty to say on that Nate so I'm not going to to say any more on that um I was going to do a little icebreaker on Menti but I'm not going to do it now because there's not a huge uh huge number of people on the call um but what I will say is just maybe 10 or 15 minutes maybe on why the music service is doing this work and why we think that it's important. Um, and and I think uh, the first thing I'll say about that is that we feel that we should be um, role models in this work. Uh, we should be leading um, and and you should be led by the example that we that we put forward as the music specialists in the city. Um, so the music service has um, published um, an equity, diversity and inclusion strategy. We've just recently published that in January. But we really began that work with real energy in 2020. If you imagine everything that was happening around the pandemic and all of that stuff there, there was a real uh, focus on the inequity, if you like, and the lack of diversity and inclusion in music education. And we've started making some real kind of investigations into that in our work. And we've had some really interesting outputs. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to do is share my screen and kind of show you where you can access that um, document itself. Um, so if I share my screen. Uh, on our website, on the home page right here. Um, you can see our kind of statement around diversity and I'll say a bit about that in a moment, but you can click here to download. The um, strategy and that will give you all the kind of meat uh, on, on the bones about that. Um, it's it's 26 pages long and today is not about going through that, so I'm not going to take you into that, but I wanted to show you where it was. So the home page on the website and you can get to the the full policy from there. I would also say that, you know, if you're here on the call, anything to do with music education in the city, we will we always route that through the news section of our website. So that's constantly being updated. So if you're trying to think about things that you might do with school, just every week or so, just get in there and have a little look at what's going on, um, because that will keep you up to date. Um, I'm going to stop sharing the screen and come back to chat to you a little bit about what's in that. Policy and what the commitment is. Um, and I think the first thing I wanted to say was that we. We have a, a created a statement there, if you saw it, um, we created a simple pledge to schools um, and that's the headline page in the diversity strategy. Um, what our music means and how we will involve people to grow and to change and to develop. Um, the the second thing that I want to say about that policy is that we have an that we have a, a a staff champions group in the music service. It's been in post or it's been in place since 2020, and that group um, looks at all of the issues around music education in our service and in the work that we do with schools. Um, that might be a quite an interesting thing to borrow if you're beginning to look at how what the curriculum might look like if it was different in your school. I don't know if, if schools have um, like champion staff groups uh, like us, but it has really worked for us. Um, 
and that group is kind of driven by data and it's driven by evidence things that we not just things that we think we need to do but things that we can see and we can evidence that we need to look at or change um some of the things that we've done as a music service has in terms of then developing the service it has been to look at the staff so we've done a lot of training with staff and that's how we first came into the interactions that we have with Nate because Nate did some training with our staff in May uh, last year or two years ago I think it was now um, we've also done some work in terms of recruitment you know actively recruiting teachers from different cultures and different specialisms and we're really trying to develop our own workforce through training but also through just the approaches that the workforce take uh, in terms of their work in schools. Um, and so you might say, well, that's all very good, but what's actually changing? Um, and I think you'll notice uh, some things changing into next year, but I wanted to list a few of the things that we that have changed and that we that we mentioned in the strategy. Um, for example, we have a transgender policy. We have students that we're working with right across the school system that um, that have changed their gender and that has had implications for the way in which we work in a respectful way. So we have a transgender policy. We also have unisex toilets on site. Um, we have a peer review process within the hub that we've adopted. So that means that the music service goes to visit the work of other organisations in the city and they go and visit the work of us and other hub partners. And together there's a sense of kind of learning about EDI practices on this journey. So it's not just us, it's about cascading our work and the, the views and the kind of example, if you like, a bit further. Um, in the music service specifically, we have a, a new staff guide in our handbook around inclusive practices for our ensembles on site and our concerts. And so when we have our next series of concerts, we will have a BSL signing uh, at the events because we think that that's important that people with hearing impairments and disabilities can have a bit of better access and a bit better inclusion in the kind of work that we do. We have young people on our hub advisory board and the training that we've done with staff, we're encouraging staff to give young people a bit more agency in the work that they learn with us and the things that they do with us and that might be around the repertoire they play uh, so that that idea of the teacher being the master and always telling the student what to do that's not the way things work anymore there's a much more um, better relationship driven approach to to what we do and, and I guess in schools you might call that something like pupil voice but that's what we're doing uh, in our work um, We've consulted then further with the High Five Youth Group, which is a, a an additional needs group that the council have uh, with young people who are above the age of 11, I think, with, um, you know, um, additional needs. And we've consulted the Voices for Parents group, which have a large number of their children in the special schools. And so you'll see this week again coming online um, in weekly inclusive workshops for young people with additional needs and that covers everything from autism aspergers to severe disabilities and profound multiple learning so you'll see that we will now have a series of out of school offer for children who have that level of need and that will happen every week just like the bands and orchestras that we do in the music school um you won't know if you're not, well, you maybe unless we're visiting you, but we have an arrangement with the virtual school whereby we support children and young people in care with instrumental lessons as well. And that piece of uh, work has been happening for a good two years now. Um, so there's many ways in which the study of music can help people with social and emotional difficulties. And we're finding that that is a uh, another important part of inclusion when we're looking at equity, diversity and inclusion. Um, then into September, what you'll see in the music service is, is, is a bit of looking at music through different lenses as well. So we have a music production course that's coming online. We've piloted it last year. That will happen every week for 36 weeks next year. Um, we had rock and pop that we brought in in 2019. We had a jazz band that started this year 
uh, we had our first community mela, um, which we worked with a big, big proportion of the local kind of Indian community who came to the music school and we kind of supported music making um, during uh, Vaisakhi last year. And, and I guess they're only some of the things, but I, what I'm trying to show is that we're trying to lead by example. We're trying to like reach out to communities that we don't yet work with. We're trying to get training from people that we haven't had training from before. And we're trying to inch by inch make some changes in the way that we offer music in the city of Wolverhampton. And so I hope that you're on board with that because that's where we're going with our music. Uh, we still want to keep musical excellence uh, alongside you know inclusion and the two things are not mutually exclusive they, we can have musical excellence with the bands and orchestras and the histories that you would know about the music service and the music school but we can also have the breadth of opportunity for more children and so if you get a chance please do download the policy and at least signpost it to the people uh, to the other colleagues in schools and your head teacher because that's an important kind of strategic document for our work in the city. Good. I think I've maxed out my uh, 10 to 12 minutes there. And I, I'm, I'm going to pass us on to um, Nate, who hopefully is going to say a few words about his work uh, and his resources and things that, that can help you in your work in schools. Thanks, Over Jerry. to you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. All right, perfect. Hi, everyone. I hope you're all well. <clears throat> um, sorry if my voice kind of comes and goes. It's things, things, things are going around, and unfortunately, I've I've caught a little something. Um, <clears throat> so, as as you've already heard, um, my name is is, is Nathan Oda. I um, I work as many things, um, including a musician. So I you know I, I gig and I perform. Um, you know, many different places. I've been very fortunate um, to play in many different places around the world, and um, I <clears throat> am really passionate about music education um, for different reasons. Um, a lot of my work over the last couple of years has focused around um, around diversity. It's focused around um, inclusive inclusion. It's also focused around um, this term that some of you might have heard, decolonization, um, which we're not really going to talk about today. Um, but it's something that you might have um, seen my name if you've heard of me before, um, affiliated with. And one of the reasons why I'm really passionate about music education is obviously because I, you know, came through the system, like so many of you maybe, um, you know, went to school and had lessons at school. And I also had, was privileged enough to have lessons outside of school as well. And moving on from there, just having my, my musical background formed um, in, in, in large part in church, um, having that kind of duality of having that experience plus having experience in school um, meant that not only was I trained to, to read music, but also trained to learn by ear as well. And um, like many people, I quit playing the piano when I was young um, for many different reasons. I think you know, mainly because it just felt boring. It felt like it was a chore. It felt like you know, it, it just wasn't, it wasn't cool, right, when I was like 13 years old. And so after many, many, many years after that, in 2018, I wrote a book um, called I Wish I Didn't Quit Music Lessons, which in essence um, is a book about, about pedagogy and thinking about what it is to learn and to teach um, music, not just a piano, um, but what it is to learn an instrument and to teach an instrument and things to consider when you're teaching, things that um, parents should consider as well, carers should consider when they have young people who in their care who are learning an instrument. Um, because I realized that actually, even though we might have the ambitions to do something, even though we might have the resources to do something, um, even though we might initially have the passion to do something, it doesn't mean that we always get there. And part of the book was concerned about just figuring out, well, why is it that for many children, they start with this fire in them to want to play an instrument, to learn about music. And over time, it just, that fire diminishes and it goes in some cases. And many people are walking around all corners of the earth today thinking, well, well I wish I didn't quit playing my, my, my instrument. I wish I didn't quit playing the trumpet or the piano or the drums, the guitar, because um, I'd love to play now. And then sometimes what happens is that manifests in how they treat their young people 
um, if they're teachers or if they become parents. And this cycle continues in some ways. One of the things I realized is really important um, in all of this is um, not diversity, um, not even representation necessarily, um, but just this element of aspiration, this element of being able to have your mind open to many different things, many different ways of understanding music, many different ways of, of thinking about music, many different ways of, 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 of performing and playing and, and, and playing with others. It's all different things that I might not have gotten personally if I stayed and I didn't have experience in church, for example, and things that I might not have gotten if I didn't have the music education I had in school as well. And so it wasn't necessarily about being diverse for diversity's sake. Um, on how I think about things now, not, it's not necessarily just about, let's just be more diverse for diversity's sake, but there has to be a point to diversity, right? I think there's a couple of points to, to diversity. I think one, what I've kind of already described is this idea of diversity bringing new experiences. Um, this idea of, you know, having diverse resources and ways to learn um, not just resource wise, but also pedagogically, just different ways of learning and teaching um, mean that for many young people, one way might not work for them, but this other way it might, and they might latch onto that. And a different way might work for person three, um, but it might not work for person six. And if there's many different ways and different entry points into something, different stories, I think stories are such an important part of learning, um, especially at a young age, um, then maybe you know, there are less children who decide to quit playing an instrument, there are less children who decide that they don't want to go on to study GCSE, for example. And obviously that has knock-on effects for study higher up. So in some part, it is all about giving, just feeding young minds, feeding their curiosities and allowing them to dream and to see things that had nothing to do with them and their immediate surroundings, right? I think the other part of diversity, again, actually three parts, not two, the other part is letting them see things that they are familiar with, right? Um, many of you have probably been in that situation where you feel like your different parts of your education, not necessarily just music, often spoke to things that were hundreds of thousands of miles away or things that happened hundreds of thousands of years ago in some cases, um, but very rarely were you um, challenged to understand what was happening in your life. Right. I can imagine in history, for example, um, in years to come, they will be studying, you know, um, what happened and the, the, the story around September 11th. Right. I'm sure that will be something. I'm sure at some point there'll be, um, you know, modules that will be looking at, if not already, I'm not in tune with what's happening in history departments, but, um, you know, looking at 7-7 and the bombing that happened in London. Um, you know, these modern, these, not modern, but these, these more recent occurrences in history that have, that have shaped the way we, we, we think now, shape so many different things. Um, me being from London, realizing that, you know, even for example, it's very difficult to find a bin on the underground now because of what happened then, right? And so there's this idea around giving resources and stories and music um, and musicians and instruments that children are already familiar with, not just in terms of what these instruments do, but the people that perform them and people that they might have already heard of and have some knowledge about, but in different ways that we can enhance their knowledge about certain people and understand and the music that they could, that they have created and help them to understand a little bit more about what they already know, which is a, tight, a slightly different way of teaching than you know assuming or actually knowing that a child might not know anything about a particular subject and telling them as much as you can about that particular subject. Like I said before, in some cases, that thing might be, might, have, might exist hundreds of thousands of miles away or have existed hundreds of thousands of years ago um, and we never come into contact with that. The other thing when you think about diversity is, um, is actually, I'll come to that in a second, but um, I will just show you really briefly this book that I created um, which came out earlier, um, yeah, last year. That's time's flying, isn't it? Um, which, in self, in different ways, aims to do both of those things that I just spoke about. For some children, they might be familiar with not just. Oh, I'm sorry, it's blurry. Let's see if I can change that while I'm talking. Um, for some children, they might be familiar with West Africa. They might have already been, or they might have um, 
you know, relatives who are from different countries in West Africa. And so hopefully for them, there are many different touch points. They might not know some of the instruments that are featured in this book, um, but they might know some of the countries and have some idea. And what was very important in creating this was to make sure that it wasn't just a, a random representation of a country in West Africa. It, there are monuments um, that are included in this book that are real. You know, so if a child had been to a country, um, there'd be and have and does do have some knowledge of this country, or even just want to Google that they can and they'll find something tangible and real. And I was actually um, blessed uh, with a picture someone sent me of their children standing outside this very, if you can see it, this very monument in Senegal, um, holding this book up, which blew my mind. You know, when you, you write a book, you don't necessarily expect to see images like that. Um, but that was a moment for them to realize that there is something in their hands that they can identify with potentially more than something else that they might have come across in their lives before. And again, also the other side of it, something which many children may not have come across, it's a great way to introduce them to not only countries from in West Africa, but also instruments that they may never have heard of before. Um, I was going to do a little kind of exercise and see how many um, instruments you can name that are from West Africa that aren't called the djembe, right? That's the go-to for many of us, isn't it? Um, and so again, it's not just about educating children in this book specifically, it is about just helping us to be more aware of what's happening in the world, because it can be very easy for us, I think, um, especially as we get older, um, to know what we like and to know what we can teach very well and easily and to stick to that. Um, and not push us to ourselves to learn more, or not even just to learn, more, but to find resources that sit outside of what we already know. And so part of what I do, and part of what I have been doing over the last few years is, and I think it's very important to say this, not just to talk about diversity and say, well, it's important, because I think we can all, all of us here, um, and I'm assuming, so if someone you know doesn't agree with me, then please, by all means, say something. Um, but I think we, most of us can at least can agree that diversity is important. Um, I think the questions become, when we ask ourselves why it's important, you know, is a slightly different issue. Um, but the fact that it is important, I think, is something that we have to remember, that we, we all recognise that. And so it is about us trying to understand, well, if we talk about this thing, and many of you might have been to conferences or to CQD sessions talking about and let's broaden it out really quickly, diversity and talking about inclusion and talking about equity. And there's all these different things that we have to do now, right? And we have to consider more than maybe we did before or, um, or, or at least our organizations are thinking about these things more and, you know, and supporting us in what we're already doing way more than they might have happened you know, five years ago. And so for me and my work, it's important not just to talk about these things, right? But to also make sure that you as teachers um, educators have something that you can take away straight away um, and resources that I can point you to not just ones that I've made but others have made so that it's not just about talking about this thing and then leaving you on your own to kind of figure it out um, it is about making sure that you know very quickly you can have something that helps you personally or helps you um, uh, professionally and helps the children in your care as well and so it was a real pleasure to to speak to Kieran about about doing this, this and and it was very, very, um, very, very supportive. It has been extremely supportive um, in making sure that we get a copy of this book to every school in, in Wolverhampton, which is incredible. But again, when we think about diversity, I think then we have to think about well, then what do we do with this? Right? Is this a book that should sit on um, sitting on a shelf and just in the hopes that a child might pick it up? And in some ways, my ideal vision, this is just my vision, my ideal vision is that yes, it's a book that sits on the shelf, that if a child wants to pick it up, they can. And if they want to learn something from it, they will, right? Because they will, for sure, they will encounter something that they've never been exposed to before in this book. But the reality is, for many, um, to have a book like this and just to leave it on the shelf, and not even just this book, but to have any book, um, which is specifically kind of talking to ideas around diversity today um, or inclusion or anything, um, whether it's a book about disabled musicians, for example, a book that just sat on a shelf. Um, there's 
a box ticking exercise we can do to say, well, actually, yes, we do have a book about disabled musicians, for example, or we do have a book about um, about LGBTQIA plus musicians, right? Um, but it's sitting on a shelf. And yes, if a child picks it up, great. But if they don't, then what have we really done apart from buy a book and stick it on the shelf? And so I think in talking about diversity and realizing how important it is, I think it's also important that we are making moves and making efforts to include these resources into what we do in different ways, right? Um, that's not to say to throw out everything um, and start again. I'm saying that there are many people who are who, who are and have been you know, systematically working through their curriculum and changing things to make sure that they bring about more diversity in what they do. Um, but at the same time, there's understanding with, you know, with time and with energy and with money, et cetera, that it's not so easy to just on a dime, say it's on a dime, but just so easy, just very, very quickly to just change. Right? And so I said before, and I'm talking about this book a lot, I understand, but um, it's one of the ways in which, you know, I feel like in little ways, right? And I think this is a gradual process of, 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 of exposing children to the wider world and feeding their curiosity um, with giving them bits of information here and there and letting them know about the resources that we have available um, and make an understanding that even though a lot of learning happens in the classroom, there's a lot of learning that can and in different ways maybe should happen at home um, and lots of ways it should happen that do happen in the, in the, in the playground and happen in different spaces. Um, and how can we make sure that when learning is happening, that we've signposted certain things so that children, as they will, they will find things and they will talk about them and they will um, be curious and, and be trying to understand certain things. And so when I think about diversity again, the third thing that I wanted to touch on is what it's for. And that might sound strange because of course, you know, diversity um, for many, and I'm not asking anyone to really dig into their minds and to come up with a definition. And I'm not going to really offer a definition of diversity either. Um, but sometimes when we do think about diversity, and like I said before, we talk about diversity a lot about how important it is and why we should do it. And there are lots of people who are thinking about ways and different ways to incorporate more diversity. Even these terms, talking about diversity, sometimes make my skin crawl because, um, in essence, we are talking about. Um, you know, how do we incorporate people who are not a particular a particular um, person into what we do, realizing that for, for centuries in different ways, um, at least the very least for decades, um, we've, we've um, prioritized um, certain groups of people over others. And essentially when we say diversity, we're saying, well, we want to bring these other people in now. Um, others, including, you know, people who have similar experiences to myself. Um, as a black Caribbean man, which leads me on to another thing. I guess the, the third thing, thinking about what diversity is for. There's a sense in which we can talk about diversity and then we can implement certain things in to our teaching. I think there's another layer to this, thinking about actually um, the benefits of all of this. I don't know how many of you are familiar with attainment gaps and the statistics around um, achievement, um, but when you look at it broadly, and, and as far as I'm aware, I can't see much, um, especially before GCSE, that um, gives us a breakdown um, in music specifically. But when you look at education in general, um, there are a few groups who often sit at the bottom of expected achievement. Um, sitting at the bottom, usually we find Gypsy Roma groups. Then. We have Irish traveler groups. And these are the, these are the, as I'm sure you, you know, these are the, the, the phrases that are, uh, that are on DFE website. So we have, we have gypsy and Roma groups who often sit at the bottom. Irish traveler who sit just above and just above them, the black Caribbeans of which I'm one. And again, this is one of the reasons why this is so important to me because for me, and I think for many others too, but I can only speak for myself. It's all well and good talking about diversity and saying about how important it is um, and saying how, of how much more we should do, right? That's one. It's all well and good, that second layer, right? Of including it in the curriculum, including P 
people from different backgrounds um, and listening to their music, exploring different instruments, that's all good. But somehow, if none of that translates to these groups at the bottom who are doing far and away the worst out of everyone else, those statistics, if those statistics don't shift, if the, if the attainment gaps stay the same or widen, then I think we really have to think about and evaluate what we're doing. I don't think necessarily it means that by, by, uh, by default that if we have more um, representation of Gypsy and Roma music and musicians, that attainment gaps from Gypsy and Roma young people are going to become smaller. In the same way of Black Caribbean, there are so many more resources that we've seen talking about Windrush, talking about different styles of music from the Caribbean. And until those gaps start to close, and until the attainment and, and the, the, the progress of these, of these young people start to shift, I think we have to start thinking about, well, has this diversity, has all of this actually just been a tick box exercise? Because ultimately the people who have been at the bottom of, 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 of attainment and achievement um, are still there. And not just that they're still there, because ultimately, yes, if we are, you know, putting people into different categories, there are going to be some, there is going to be someone at the bottom just by virtue of the fact that this is how we you know, list, et cetera. But if those gaps aren't changing at all, then I think we have to ask ourselves different questions. And so what I want to do today is really just challenge you as I wrap up to think about diversity, not just in terms of you know talking of talking that good talk and saying how important it is, not just including more diverse resources into the teaching, um, you know, so that children feel um, more included and feel seen. Of course, that's important. But I encourage you to go that one step further. And as much as we can understand that distance traveled, understand, um, you know, the, the, the achievements and the attainments and the, the, the results that our young um, Gypsy and Roma um, young people are getting and our young Irish and our young traveler community um, are getting and our young Black Caribbean groups are getting and find ways in which by using books like this and other books, not just even mine, right? But other resources, um, you know, I have, for example, I have podcasts. Some children might learn better by listening. And so I've created podcasts which talk about different musicians. As time goes by, I'll expand it to talk about different concepts and it might even become a whole educational podcast where we might talk about, um, you know, what time signatures mean and we might talk about um, Tal in, in, in Indian classical music and we might talk about many different musical concepts but audibly because many children might actually learn better that way and might absorb the information a bit better in that way um, and other ways I have an interactive map which is attached to this book just a simple QR code that's free um, that you can use in class but again thinking at that deeper level of making sure that even in all of this we're thinking about you know the outcomes and we're thinking about these groups who often sit at the bottom and who, who not just feel marginalized but in different ways are marginalized when it comes to GCSE results and A-level results if they even get to that point right making sure that they have they are, their, their minds are being sparked and they're being curious and they're learning in a much more efficient and effective way um, as we know music you know has its as amazing effect on the brain what it can do not just in music but in different other areas which again is a whole other subject that we could go into um but again that's when we encourage you to think about diversity in those ways um, and to make sure that in, in everything we do we are um, not only thinking about the you know the historically marginalized from a point of view of representing them and us um in a better in a better way and more but making sure that um, these historically marginalized groups don't stay that way um, thank you listening and um, if there are any questions please feel free um, to ask does anyone have any questions before i start to chip in all right i guess i've got a question uh, that just might help 
colleagues before I kind of summarize some of the stuff that you've said there. Um, one of the things you talked about was curiosities of children, and I just wrote down how can schools feed the curiosities of children? So what would their starting points be? I mean, you've mentioned your podcast. I think that's a pretty decent starting point. Yeah, I think there's so many ways. Um, so, for example, we went to, and I forget which school it was now, but um, the headmaster was telling us about um, uh, about the music that they used to play, um, and it used to be classical music as children walked into school. And um, what they've done is they've diversified that, and now they play different styles of music. Um, and that's just one way, one little way of, you know, asking, making them be curious about, you know, maybe asking questions about, well, okay, for what we've changed, and why have we changed, right? And then more questions around, well, what song is this? If they don't know the song, and maybe some of their colleagues might know the particular song that's being played. Um, but then, you know, in asking those questions around, well, whose music were we listening to earlier today? Um, you know, we can give an answer that doesn't necessarily have to result in a whole lesson. Um, but I think part of just just feeling that curiosity is almost, you know, throwing something out there, giving a quick answer and almost leaving it there in a sense, um, or pointing them into different directions of where they can go and explore. Um, because if children want to know, they'll, they'll go and figure it, they'll find it out. Um, and I'm saying all that with the understanding that there is limited time, whereas you might want to go into details, but you know, time permitting that you probably may not be able to. Um, and so I think having, you know, whether it's, you know, books available, whether it's like flashcards, you know, available, um, whether it's playing different styles of music, um, it's, it's having, you know, the posters on the wall. I have posters of, of, you know, film and TV composers, for example, one that I have on the website, which um, has been a really interesting one because I realized that when we think about film and TV composers, there's like two or three names that often pop up. Um, and usually they're, you know, there's either a couple of white guys um, or um, it's like one, like, not, like Rachel Pullman comes up, right? Um, but there are so many more, <laughs> right? So again, I think with the idea around those posters wasn't necessarily um, to, to say, these are people you need to know. It's just thinking about how, when I was educated, there was one poster that stayed on the wall. And I'll never forget the poster because it was there for like seven years. <laughs> and that's a whole other thing about should you have a poster up for seven years? I don't know. Um, but it was something that we never talked about that poster or the person in it. Um, but he was there. I think in that same way, having different people, different who've made different styles of music and from different times and different places around the world, having it there without even absolutely saying anything, um, you know, could be that that spark that ignites when a child is 15, 16, 18, 22 years old, when, like, when they come across another name and they realize, oh, actually, I had a picture of Robert Glass from my wall and he, I just saw that he won a Grammy. Who is this person? Let me find out. Um, I see there's a hand. Sarah, I can't see your last name, sorry. Hi, Nate, yeah. Nice. I just got a question for you. Have you got any, examples really where you know that organizations schools or whatever have successfully gone out to I suppose actively find out um and it, about musics in their communities around them and you know to invite sort of um in, invite families and communities to, sh to share some of the musics that are going on outside school that you know we could learn more about and have an opportunity to to celebrate those um to be honest no I not because it's not happening um, but unfortunately, I think one of the drawbacks to being a freelancer is that often you kind of do something and then you're gone, right? And then you might do something again a year later with the same organization, or maybe nothing else happens. Um, and so for the large part, I just don't, don't know what is happening after I kind of do something, uh, which is a shame, and, you know, when questions like this come up, I wish I could just be like, yeah, this place, and this place, and this place, but it's not. But what I do, I remember that. Um, and so, you know, next time I'm speaking to different organizations, asking them. But again, these are, I think these are things that are happening in different places, um, maybe with, maybe not as frequently as, you know, it might be as, as, as we might like. Um, but I think slowly but surely, you know, people are doing that. So if I do hear of something like that, I'll 
I'll remember and I'll let I'll let Kieran know and you know <laughs> me and Kieran are always I, I live I live in in um technically Wolverhampton I think yeah so you know I'm I'm around so I'm sure I'll bump into you at some point anyway. Thank you. Um, I'm not looking to keep people very long, but I, I think it is there's a few takeaways for me. Um, one of them is really obvious to me because um, if you like, this is how we started. That that was a really interesting provocation around. Uh, it's all fine and well having diversity, but what's the purpose of it? What's it for? What's the benefits? Um, and I think that's how we started, actually. Um, we started with a bit of a provocation around, well, what are we going to do? And I think what we've learned from our work um, and some of the work that you've kind of provoked us into thinking about has been that actually you don't need SLT on board and you don't need a massive big strategic policy and you don't need all of that. Change in this area happens by taking little small steps around what what children um, see, like you've talked about posters on the walls, what they see, what they hear, like the just changing the music that you play in assembly uh, and what they do, just changing some of the subject areas in which you look at. Because let's be honest, we, we only we only teach what we know. And so we perpetuate what we know. And if really the musics that we know are Mozart and Beethoven and the things that are on uh, on the school kind of intranet that we used last year, then we'll just keep doing the same, won't we? So I think my takeaway would be to tell people um, to try one or two little things different. Um, and I guess your next question might be uh, for us, well, that's fine and well, but where do we where do we find that stuff? Where do we get that stuff? Uh, and this is where I'm I'm not intending to plug Nate's work specifically, but I do want to say that Nate's podcast it's called the Why Music Podcast, and it's on it's on its second series now. It's got like about twenty odd episodes. That's like free. It's on Spotify. It's like you know you go on there and you can kind of learn about a new composer or a new person. Um, the book that we're sending out to schools, where are all the music uh, West Africa? Well, there are there is another book, where are all the instruments European orchestra that you've written? So that's all about the European instruments. There is a book, where are all the black female composers? That's another great book Nate's written to have in the library. Uh, where Why is my piano black and white is another one of your uh, books, again, dealing with those kind of issues. You've got another book, Let's uh, listen and celebrate. We got some copies of that in the music service. That's by Collins, and that's got kind of like music from different cultures and countries in it. Um, and so you can get free ways of getting diverse, and then there's some paid ways of getting diverse. And then there will be other people out there uh, and things on YouTube. I think it's just about making the first step to see what elements of difference you can bring in that might encourage just children that, and to think differently or to become included or 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 or, or something else um, and that's a takeaway for me to keep doing the small stuff actually um, Victoria I can see you've got a hand up there too I just say really quick if if you want some free stuff um, <laughs> I don't know always that yeah free stuff um, as, so I have there's there's lots of women on my podcast that I spoke about um, and so I made some free um, worksheets to go along with them um, for Black for Black History Month, for Women's History Month this month. Um, so you can just download them; they're free from our website. Um, and so the idea is, you know, you can some of the they're they're not all they're, all the questions aren't for every single age. Um, so you can kind of take what you want or leave what you want question wise. Um, but there's it's a, just a simple PDF that you can download for I think there's eleven of them. Um, in which you can, if you want, print them off and use them in class um, or not, or just use them for yourselves to kind of prompt questions if you, you know, whatever you want to do, but it's there. Teachers like free stuff. <laughs> Victoria. Yeah, so um, it wasn't really a question, but it was like an idea that I had. So I know that World Music Day is coming up in June, which is obviously a little bit far away, but it'll soon be upon us. I was kind of thinking that maybe 
like in our school we could actually have like um that sort of day where children would be exposed to different music from different cultures and kind of like bring it all together in some kind of celebration um because i know that other people have done that in other areas um of the united kingdom and it's worked quite well and also um what you were saying about your podcast and that'd be really good for like the children to get involved with that and listen um to what you have to offer and also I'm all about doing like a pupil voice to get to children talking to them about what the music they listen to and what it means to them because I do feel like I don't always engage maybe probably because we haven't always got the time to actually engage with the children you know and get their you know opinions across about what music they like does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Were you going to say something, Kira? Uh, no, what I was thinking was when you said about the pupil voice, it, it's something that if you think about the music service, the work that we do, every year we're going into schools as visitors. And so we meet quite often like a new class of year threes or a new class of year fours or a new group of whatever. And so we have a little kind of getting to know you little kind of worksheet where we ask does anybody in the you know has anybody in the house played before like a brother or sister what's your favorite music who's your favorite artist what did you want we just ask a little bit just to find out about the child you know why do you want to learn because if they say oh, i want to learn because my uncle plays saxophone and he's in a jazz band well that might change your approach to how you'd work with that child whereas if we just went in and we taught all children with one tutor book that wouldn't work so i think pupil voice, if you have space at all to do it, is a really good thing to do. I would say as well, I think that's a really interesting idea um, coinciding with World Music Day. Um, <clears throat> I'm doing something which isn't the same, um, but I'm doing something, it's going to be on the 4th of July um, and it's going to be online. It's going to be free for you know any primary school um, that wants to partake. But what we're going to do is to have like a day from nine to three, probably even from nine to three, of um, like every hour, we're gonna, I'm gonna have either like an interview with a with a musician, um, or I'm gonna have a book reading by someone who's written a book about music. Um, and so yeah, that's July fourth. There'll be more information, you know, as 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 time goes by. We're only in March, so I've got to get moved on. But you know, the, the plans are in place to do something like that because again, it's just that, that thing. Hope at the end of the year where hopefully you know you don't have to tune into the whole day if you don't want to um and we'll make we'll record it all and make it available for like about a week after as well just in case you want to like dip in and out of different things because obviously can't case for everyone's everyone in everyone's school the show is going to be kind of different right um but yeah doing things like that i think and so i think it'd be really great so victoria i don't know maybe one day it'd be great to do something like in person um along those lines of having you know different bands come in and having different people just kind of, you know, or maybe doing it over a course of a week or something like that. But it's, it's a good idea and, you know, um, it's it's something I'll, I'll think about and maybe it does become, you know, after we do this this year, um, something that we can like, approach the Arts Council to get some funding together and try and, you know, actually do something really interesting like that. So um, thank you for the suggestion. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have a think and see what we can do, but I'm sure there's something because there's so much diversity in this part of the world. Um, in the Western Midlands, like there's there's so many people who I think would be really, 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 really up for doing something like that. So um, I wonder if there's a way to maybe at the Mac or something we could we could organise something. Yeah, we probably have to start now from now to get it done yeah, for next year. Really I good. think that's a really good idea. Yeah, because I'm in Wolverhampton and Heath Town, so again, like, we've got so many cultures and we've got like you know just that real interest in you know. Um, that music opportunity and just to get it across to everybody, you know, what music there is out there. So, yeah, it'd be really good. All right, Kieran, we need to talk. <laughs> well, well. Uh, are there any other questions before we kind of finish for today? Anything you haven't said, Nate, that you want to that you want to tell us about before we close? Um. Not particularly. I think I think you know. For if you want more information, um, my website has got more information about yeah. all the different things, um, which is nateholdermusic.com or 
the wirebooks.co.uk, either one of those two has stuff. Um, but yeah, I think fundamentally and most importantly, just want to just encourage, you know, um, you know, just reach out if there's anything um, that I can help with, you know, this idea that we've just been given, uh, you know, we'll talk here and we'll see what we can, if we can yeah, yeah. next year. I think, I think it's entirely possible. I can see Sue's come up with a question. I think it's more of a statement than a question. Um, I, I'm actually really thankful that Nate's been asked to speak. I've worked in Wolverhampton for a long time and I've worked with a wide range of children and um, in a lot of the classes that I teach, um, particularly music, I've got children from so many, so such a wide range of cultures and if I offer the opportunity for children to come forward and, and sing or to perform, they want to share their culture and there's absolutely no reason for us not to give them that opportunity, apart from the fact that our, our curriculum is so rammed full of other things. But for me, for the children's mental health, we need to understand that they deserve an opportunity to speak. And what Nate's been saying is, is the same, give <coughs> them an opportunity to speak and to share their understanding of life. And it's not just music, it is life through music quite often. Yeah, here, here. I think we're on the same page with that. Um, I think that, that that concept that we're the teacher and we should be giving them everything all the time, I think that's not maybe it. I think kind of isn't the word education, doesn't it come from to lead, to lead out from the Latin educere, to lead. So I think part of our job as musicians is to lead out from what they already know about music and what their experiences are. And I think we could be doing a bit more of that in the subject in general. Um, bro, well, listen, I think that's a great kind of profound statement to finish on. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you, Nate, for your work. We'll make sure we send out the um, link to the video when we've posted it again, and we'll send out uh, Nate's web address and stuff like that so you can kind of see some of the resources we talked about today. But I think we'll leave it there and thank you very much. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.